Hello, and welcome to the second panel presentations for the 2022 AML conference. Thanks. Thank you for joining us. All right, let's get started. So the first thing we're going to do is I'm going to go around and have each of the panelists introduce themselves uh, in the order of, of the panel. And Darlene Young also has a couple of guests that are going to be participating in her panel. So I'm going to ask, um, ask them to introduce themselves as well. And so the order of that is first Darlene, then Kent, and then Gabrielle. So Darlene, you can go and then your two guests. Take Thank it away. You. Thank you. My name is Darlene Young. I um, write some and teach some at BYU and love AML, um, have a long history with AML. And I started the Facebook group MoPoRimo, which is what I'm going to be talking about. I brought two guests with me who are participants in that group, and um, I'd like them to go ahead and introduce themselves. Scott? Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm Scott Hales. I am a, a writer and a poet, also a longtime participant in AML and a five-year veteran of MoPoRimo. My name is Alisa Broby. I am a law student at BYU. I also write poetry. This is my first MoPo Rimo, my first AMO. Okay, so do you want me to just go ahead and start now, or are you going to introduce the other two first? Right, we, I want the other panelists to introduce themselves. So Kent and then get and then Gabrielle. Sorry about that. Uh, my name is Kent Larson. Um, I'm a uh, want to be an academic is probably the best way to put it. Uh, I do my own research into uh, Mormon literature, um, his, usually historical stuff, uh, something on the order of what Mike Gostin was talking about last night. Um, and I live here in New York City, and I try to put that uh, what I found in practice in my uh, speaking and writing and stuff here in New York. So. Hello, my name is Gabriel Gonzalez. I'm a professor of translation at the University of Texas Rio Grande Valley. And um, right now, my home country of Uruguay. Uh, and I, my connection, I guess, with Mormon literature comes from sort of dabbling in it and admiring it. Um, and I've, I've done some writing too, and I'll be talking a little bit about that today. So thank you uh, all for being here. Um, so two of the main things that Eugene England did um, as part of his contribution to the world of Mormon letters are kind of bibliographic and historic, historiographic work on Mormon literature, uncovering texts, grouping texts together. And then uh, another one was creating communities for Mormon writers to write literature, edit literature, public publish Mormon literature, talk about Mormon literature. And so our three sessions today are um, all various aspects of those elements that, that Eugene England um, contributed to the world, world of Mormon literature. And so I, I was very happy to see these um, presentations submitted because they all really fit in with, with the spirit of, of, his, um, of his legacy. So we're gonna start with Darlene, go right ahead. Right. Yes, I can speak to community. So for five years now, I've been conducting an experiment in creativity and community, which I call MoPoRimo, which stands for Moment Mormon Poetry Writing Month. And it began as my effort to overcome a post MFA creative slump. Remembering an earlier experience with NaNoWriMo, I decided to jumpstart my work with an intense, sustained practice for a specific period of time. I invited a few friends to join me on a project of producing an LDS theme poem every day for a month. I created a Facebook group where we could post our work and report on our progress. And this project turned out to be so good for me that I did it the next year and the next. And now our group has grown to include, I think it was 112 members last time I checked. And not all these members participate fully. They don't all write a poem and post it every day. Some. Um, 
just use the month to revise and they uh, report on their progress. Some I have heard write poems at home but don't post them and others just read and enjoy the work of um, those of us who are posting. But during our month, it's a very active group with an exciting sense of community and support. And I'd like to share with you five lessons from Mopo Rimo that are borrowed from or can be extended to life in general. I call this list Mopo Rimo as spiritual, that's in parentheses, practice. I'm also going to read a few poems that came from the project and I'll ask Scott and Alexa to help me with that. Okay, so five lessons. Number one, decide once. I'm a writer who's really comfortable not writing. I can go a long time without writing and I've been blessed with a lot of free time, which I could write, but what happens is I find myself wondering, huh, what, I wonder if I'll write today. And I'm not sure uh, whether I will and I'm not sure how much and it's sort of like I'm just waiting for a lightning to strike. And there's just too many good books to read and too many British mystery shows to be binged and it's just easy not to work. So enter the concept of deciding once and I've um, experienced this in other aspects of my life. I'm at a point in my life where I exercise every day. It's not a question anymore. I just know that I'm going to. And I have friends who run marathons. Scott, you run marathons, I know. Um, you make that commitment, you put money behind it, and then you just have to slot that practice into your schedule. So the same thing applies to Mopo Rimo. At least for a month, I commit, and then I don't have to make a decision every morning. I know exactly what I'm going to do, and I know how to tell when I'm done for the day. It's a great feeling when I get the poem written early because the rest of the day is just so free and everything is so vibrant and um, I'm more present knowing I got my work done. Um, in a big project, it's important that once you make a decision, you put some scaffolding into place. Part of the scaffolding that helps people succeed in our Mopo Rimo project is the sense of community in the group. Those of us who fully participate begin to feel loyalty and maybe even some obligation to each other. And that's a good thing and it helps us motivate us on days we feel too tired to show up. Over the month we start to get a sense of each other's work and we anticipate each other's names showing up in the feed and we kind of want to be part of the action. Which brings me to lesson number two. Synergy is real. Synergy is of course the concept that the result of a combination of efforts becomes greater than the sum of its parts. When we interact in a community, watching for, reading, and praising each other's efforts, our work gets more creative than if we had just been working on our own, or I would add working just in a critique group. For example, sometimes we have themes emerge, like waves that spread. Poets catch the wave begun by someone else and write it out. Poems will be written in response to other poems or as extensions of the themes of previous poems. This is why I brought in my friends to show you some examples of that. So I'm going to read you a poem I wrote and then I've asked Alixa to read a poem that I noticed similar themes in that she posted a little bit after mine. So here's mine, it's called Recovered. It has an epigraph from Abraham 2.16, therefore eternity was our covering. I am cold, Lord. Cover me with stars. Tilt my chin with your fingertip so that I drink up night dazzle. Cover me in my goings and comings like a gangster's backup, oozy, arcing rainbows in the presence of my enemies. I am your child, child of the parted sea, the whirlwind. I parade around town covered by bespoke God-tailored robes, royal, obstacles melting like jelly at my touch. I'm flush. You've got my back, your breath on my neck. The trees gossip buzz my name, God's daughter. There is family resemblance. I glow with inherited light. I light my children, my child's self, even when this trundle of bones grows weary. The pill bug curls when he needs to, the grouse seeks shelter in the lee of a rock, then furls forth in glory, so sure she is that she is beautiful. As am I, lo, here am I against the sky. Behold. Okay, Alexa. This poem is called Father. She had never thought beyond what she could hold in her palm to trace the root of blood before it settled in her thumb. She'd heard it discussed, that her bones were stardust, but stuttered to trust in specks so small. 
One day on bended knee, it all clicked into place. God was the seed of it all. She had his line and face. Thank you. She's much better than I am, particularly at rhyme. Thanks, Alixa. Okay, here's another one that I posted. Um, I guess it was last year, right during COVID. Um, and I was a little bit desperate. So this is autobiographically true. At age 50, she buys pink roller skates. Okay, okay, it was cliche, the Mormon housewife budget version of the mullet and Harley, the dramatic career change, which is to say midlife crisis. But it was something else too. For one thing, it was spring. After an ugly winter, a winter of ugly politics and ugly disease and ugly politics about the disease and diseased politics and chronic unease, the eye yearned for light, for bright. And so when she saw that black was out of stock, she knew that pink was fate, kismet, exactly what the universe intended. Bright pink with lemon laces, looking like candy, those Laffy Taffies in the bottom bin at the 7-Eleven she'd passed every day on the way home from school, three for a quarter, and three would last until she got home, mouth sticky with sunshine, those days before she'd lost play because play had become her job. These skates would feel like candy, she thought, and clicked to add to cart the bright pink wrist guards and knee pads too, knowing she would be a spectacle in her suburban cul-de-sac, but daring herself like a teenager at a stoplight on Maine, 10 p.m. on a summer night, a car of cute boys in the next lane. A week later, her teenagers held up cameras laughing as she skated around the kitchen island to disco tunes like a breeze from a new direction in May. They remembered that she used to sing at the top of her lungs sometimes. They remembered that she was pretty. Okay, and then Scott posted <laughs> a poem that seemed a little bit in response to that a few days later. Go ahead, Scott. It's called Darlene's Skates. Bright pink with lemon laces, Darlene's skates are candy-colored time machines. Follow them back round and round the rink of time to disco night at Ricky's Skate and Eat. Darlene is the queen. Try to catch her with those rosy rockets on her feet. She can scissor and spin, skate forward and back. She is Donna Summer on wheels, the Sultana of Salcow. Don't be surprised if she turns a figure eight into a figure ten blindfolded. She is Mercury in fancy winged footwear, and her message is this, play. Yea, how beautiful are the skates of she who preaches the gospel of play. Lace them tight. The disco ball is flashing, and you have the floor. Thanks. So just so you guys can see that this was real, here's my, uh, I don't know if you guys can see this. Can you see this screen? <laughs> there we go. Okay. Um, <laughs> number three, it's important to have space to play. This involves having space to be lousy. We live in a doing society. Our culture tends to make us feel we've been irresponsible if we can't show that something we invest time in has brought good results. This kind of pressure is poison to creativity because it makes us goal oriented and afraid of risk. How can a poet create something really fresh and interesting when she has such performance pressure? Poet Dean Young says the error is not to fall, but to fall from no height. He's talking about how poetry becomes stale when a poet is afraid of risk. A poet needs space to mess around, try things out. She needs space to play. Mopo Raimo is a safe place to mess around because we're all in the same boat with the same crazy goal. Towards the middle of the month when we feel desperate because we've picked all of our own low hanging fruit, people start getting a little punchy, writing poems on crazy topics, experimenting with form, riffing on each other's work as we saw, pushing boundaries. For me, some of these experiments fail disastrously, but intriguingly. Dean Young also says, your genius is in your error. Our failures can teach us about what we really know and where we really want to go. Although messy, some of the experiments contain the seeds of something new and exciting that could be explored later. 
I feel strongly that our church culture could benefit from a greater acknowledgement that life is supposed to be messy. We're seeing too many young people break down with anxiety because we have focused too much on purpose-driven achievement and not enough on play. We need to be better at giving ourselves and each other room to be lousy. And I have to thank Harlow Clark for this phrase, space to be lousy, which he used in an editorial when he was poetry editor at Eriantum a long time ago, not um, uncoincidentally about the time I was publishing in Eriantum. <laughs> he was talking about how it's important to give writers space to be lousy and publish them even when they're not quite ready for prime time, which I'm grateful for. Lesson number four, showing up is what matters. During Mopo Rimo, the whole goal is simply to show up. Sometimes you produce something great, sometimes you don't. Doesn't matter. Regardless of the quality of your work, at the end of each day, there's something new in the world that didn't exist before, and that's worth celebrating. You might choose to fix it up, or you might choose to learn from it and move on, not forgetting to thank it for its service, a la Marie Kondo. What matters is that because you showed up, you have become even more of what you want to be, and that is an artist who works. I believe that this is what a life of faith means. Simply show up. Doesn't matter if you don't feel it. Doesn't matter if you're clumsy. You show up. You show up when you're not sure. You show up when you're weak. You show up when the evidence from the day before says you seem incapable of progress. Faith is action. It's what you do, whether you feel sure or not. You simply show up and trust the process that over a lifetime, Jesus Christ can make something of you. Finally, lesson number five, manna arrives. Every year along about day seven or 16, I feel tapped dry. Surely I've written about every subject, said all I have to say. There's no new angle, no new insight. The delight of play has ebbed and I am faced with only a sense of a chore to be gotten through. And yet, and yet a poem shows up. Maybe I'll have a day or two of garbage poems, but I keep my commitment keep putting myself in the chair and my fingers on the keyboard, and then something surprises me. And the next day, I'm surprised again. More poems come. Some of them are even pretty good. I realized that if I hadn't returned on days 18 and 19, the gem I produce on day 20, the one that excites me and makes the whole month worth it would never exist. And then at some point, maybe around day 22, I start seeing poems everywhere. It's as if a light switch is thrown and my subconscious realizes that I really do plan to be at the keyboard and it's safe to show up. Sometimes toward the end, I've even written two poems in a day. It becomes a creative high. Maybe it's like runners getting into the zone. I wouldn't know, but it feels great. Don't get me wrong. By the end of the month, I am very, very glad to be done. It takes me a few weeks to want to start revising my drafts or months sometimes. Um, I'm ready to hit the locker room for a good long shower and a massage, but it's a great feeling of satisfaction. So I loved a poem that Eric Jepsen posted on the last day of Mopo Raimo one year about this feeling. So I'm going to read that. A song for the end of Mopo Raimo. Tomorrow I'll not write a poem. There will be no poems for me. I've written a lot of poems thus far, so no more poems for me. Tomorrow, tomorrow, I will be free from writing more meter and rhyme. Tomorrow, trees will just be trees, not the mind of God or space time. For tomorrow, you see, is the first, and the first is for break de la brain. Of your comments, sure, I may read in reply, but of posy, I'll surely refrain. Will tomorrow produce time for prose or even a time to repose? The rhymo called Mopo will fosho be so closed. If I'll read or I'll doze, no one knows. The time that we've spent has been dandy. I surely mean not to complain. And if Darlene should call us to do it again, I'll gladly pick up this fine chain. I love his line about tomorrow the trees will just be trees because that's really what happens is you start just seeing poem ideas everywhere. It's like, get, quit haunting me, get away. I've gotten better at reminding myself during the bleak mid-month lull that the poems will come. My job is not to write 28 poems, because we switched to February, which was, <laughs> which was not um, unimportant to us <laughs> at the end of the month. Um, it is to write just one today. The daily poems are like manna. They come, but worrying about all the days ahead is like hoarding it, which we know leads to rot. I get in trouble if I try to see around the corner to tomorrow or next week, but if I put my nose down and do what I need to with this day, this moment, I'll make my way through the month. 
I think that this is the way God wants us to live. We are to do our best with what's in front of us and trust him to care for us tomorrow and next year. His help and grace will come as we need it, but it is not our business to see around the corner to how things will work out. This is a beautiful lesson I have been taught over and over again with my health, my resources, my energy, and my creativity, and I'm very grateful for it. So that was my last lesson. I'm going to end with a poem that I produced in Mopo Rimo this year. It's called God as a Verb. And the epigraph is from Buckminster Fuller. God, to me, it seems, is a verb, not a noun. What does it mean, this godding? Is to God a transitive verb? And if so, am I subject or object? I try out as subject, wielding God as magic wand. I god my world-weary teenager's whines with mixed results. I god the fact that he needs new sneakers and that he has lost his winter coat again. I god the clogged toilet, the frozen stray cat who died beneath the porch. I try to god the party where I'm shy and miserable, but fail and go home early. Let me wrench myself then into object. God me, sweet blue morning that follows awkward nights. God me, you two in the elevator, grin of my boys as he tells me a joke. Yea, even you, doctor's bill, oil leak, even politics on Facebook. I will conjugate my godding, subjunct myself wholly. By breathing, be breathed, by turning, be turned. Consider the dandelions of the field, how they, by godding the breeze, become in turn godded, haze of downy glory, numberless as the stars. Thank you. Thanks, Darlene. That was great. We'll now turn it over to Kent. Darlene, that was wonderful. It was really wonderful. I, I'm, I'm tempted to join, though I'm not a poet by, by any stretch of nation. Um, it reminds me of something I think that's important, something I've realized over the last decade or so, uh, maybe two more decades, because my boss taught me this a, a long time ago, and it's kind of related to uh, to what I'm going to talk about a little bit today. Let me find my screen here and get my stuff up. Um, so what I want to, um, what I'm talking about is a little bit about the bulk and the amount of Mormon literature that we have available to us. Um, uh, what I learned years ago is, uh, and this is something I think Darlene was mentioning, uh, is the idea that it takes a lot of bad literature in order for us to have good literature. Um, we have to produce and we have to have it around a lot. Um, I've looked a lot at how much literature there is, how much Mormon literature there is, and I'm certain that there's a lot of it that's not very good. Um, but I'm also certain that if we do not remember our literature, the literature that we have had in the past, that we're going to have a hard time producing good literature in the future. Like many of you, I care, care deeply about literature and what our people have produced. And I've tried to put that love and that interest in uh, our literature in practice. I've looked around for poetry and stories and things like that, that um, that I can uh, you know, put in place. Um, I currently serve on the High Council in our, our stake. And so I will find often a work of Mormon literature, a poem usually, to share as part of my talks. Uh, this is one I've used more than once. Joseph H. Ward was a member of the church and uh, a poet, produced this uh, volume that included this in, the, in 1978, I think it was. Um, and I've used it as a kind of a self-deprecating bit of self-deprecating humor as I've started my talks. Over their devoted head, while words, while the words thundered, snugglyly, snugly and heedlessly, snored the six hundred. Great was the preacher's theme. Screwed on was all his scheme. Neither with shout nor scream could he disturb the dream of the six hundred. Terrors to the right of them, terrors to the left of them, terrors in front of them. Hell itself plundered of its most awful things, all those unlawful things, weak-minded preachers fling at the dumbfounded. Boldly he spoke and well. 
on all on deaf ears it fell. Vain was his loudest yell, volley then thundered, fair for caring, truth to be told, neither for heaven nor hell, snored the six hundred. It goes on for many um, additional stanzas, but I like this idea that um, uh, what he's doing with playing with the charge of the light brigade to um, to um, look at uh, uh, the relationship between preacher and, and audience. Of course, I'm not surprised that this poem did not make the uh, AML 100, but I think that in spite of it not being all that great a poem and rather derivative, um, it has its uses, as does most of, of, of literature. In fact, I chose this particular poem simply because it isn't that good. The point is, as I'm trying to say, literature isn't what literature is best, but it's rather what literature is known, what literature do we have? If li Mormon literature is important, shouldn't it be quoted and cited or at least referred to sometimes? Isn't that in the AML our goal? If so, maybe we should be trying to find, to find a way to make Mormon literature easier to be found. Well, what do we mean by found? Um, there are lots of examples of important works that have been found over time. Moby Dick, as I understand it, was found in 1910 or so in a, by a literature professor who was going through a, uh, a used bookstore. Beowulf was sitting in an archive and was discovered by uh, uh, literature, literary researchers searching through and actually looking at the materials that were there. The Epic of Gilgamesh was hidden in, um, uh, and, and discovered by archeologists. Um, and, but it was one of those works apparently that was well known in its time and completely forgotten later. Even Shakespeare's plays had its time when it was, they were threatened to have been forgotten. It was only uh, about seven years after Shakespeare's death that his friends, fearing that he would be forgotten, went and collected all of the different plays that had been published and, and produced what is now known as the, the first folio of his work. Um, so I think we need to have the humility to see that we won't know what we have now, what of those items we have now will be considered important and valuable in the future. Finding these items means collecting all of the older items that we have and making them available. If only we had a place where everything was already collected. Well, it was along these lines of, of thinking that I started my own project a lot, um, about a decade ago. Because there wasn't any easy way to collect this material, I decided I downloaded the wiki software and set it up on my own server and started collecting materials. I figured it was an easy way of collecting my notes and I would have it available to me no matter where I was. I just needed internet access. And uh, I started collecting um, mainly poetry, um, things, the full text of poetries along with the, uh, the references to the source text. I worked through lists of published Mormon materials uh, such as I went to Flake's Mormon bibliography and just went item by item looking to see if there was any poetry, any stories or anything in those volumes. I soon got into a Mormon uh, uh, periodicals where I discovered that huge amounts of those, the poetry that we have were published in these periodicals. Um, I ended up uh, going through through these periodicals, I added in material specific, especially that that was collected by artist Partial on Keep a Pitching In from her own attempts at collecting items from um, these old periodicals. Unfortunately, my efforts were all rather intermittent. I would go some days where I would do five and 10 and 20 poems and or, or stories in a day collected, and other times I would go for months without collecting anything. Recently, I decided this is kind of crazy. I've collected a lot. I've used this archive, I've found things in it that uh, I've used in talks and in stories and in and things that I've written. Um, but in order for it to be complete in any sense, I need to figure out how much is there? How much work does there need to be done in order for us to actually have a complete uh, record of Mormon literature? 
what's there. Well, so I tried to get an idea. Um, being kind of a wonk, uh, a little bit, not really a statistician, but having enough background that I don't think I'm um, too far off, I decided I'd produce a methodology and take a sample. So I focused on periodicals. Fortunately, I think that's where the bulk of material is. What we have in monographs in, in, in published books um, is to be honest, rather, rather easy to find, especially with things like Google Books. Um, it's also um, uh, generally rather accessible and it's where our, our efforts tend to focus. We don't tend to focus on periodicals. I decided to limit then what we were look, I was looking at to a reasonable time frame, And I went through the 1980s simply because um, the 1970s through 1980 was a kind of a watershed and change in Mormon periodicals. Um, the church in 1971 consolidated all the different periodicals there were and uh, centralized all the control over periodicals. And so the nature of uh, periodicals and the amount of literature that was published in periodicals changed substantially during that time. So I created a universe of all of the relevant periodicals. I didn't include the Deseret News, local newspapers. I didn't include periodicals that didn't really carry literature, although you can find some pieces occasionally in them, things like the Journal of Discourses and the Historical Records. Um, so I went through and found uh, over 26,925 issues of periodicals. This is over 66 different periodicals. I then uh, put together a, uh, a little database of them and um, I took a sample of 300. And in that sample, I went and collected for each period uh, periodical issue, the place where it was published, the editor, the publisher, the number of pages in the issue, as well as the number of poems, the number of short stories, and the number of installments of stories, that is because many stories were published serially in those periodicals. Um, now there's all sorts of problems with this methodology. I don't claim it's perfect. My sample of 300, to be brutally honest, is simply not large enough to get very de definitive in terms of its of, of what I am presenting to you here. So you should take all of this with a grain of salt, uh, of salt. but let me share you with you what I found. Roughly 52,500 poems, plus or minus about 10%. In this presentation, <coughs> I left out any kind of confidence inter intervals, okay? Um, but the confidence interview, well, at least on the top level, is about 10%. So 52,000 plus or minus 10%. So something between 47,000 and 57,000 poems published during that period of time. 16,500 short stories, installments of longer stories, around 5,000. If you um, consider that, uh, that uh, these installments were anywhere from two to 12 or more items published seriously, serially, that means the number of novellas we're talking about is probably in the range of, say, 500, something like that. I don't know about you, this seems like a lot. In terms of language, by language, I have to caution the, the individual languages, especially if you get outside of English, the confidence interval is much larger, so these numbers are much rougher. But still, you have in Danish and Swedish and German, thousands of poems, uh, often up to a thousand short stories and you know, many novels uh, or novellas published in these installments. Um, I don't know about you, what you react to this. And given that this is a limited universe that we're looking at, I've excluded the desert news. I've excluded um, a lot of other, you know, the things since 1980. Um, I've excluded unpublished items. So there's quite a lot here. Let's look at some of this um, broken down a little bit though, in spite of the fact that the, when you break it down, the numbers are rougher. It changed a bit over time. The gray bars that are, um, that are here represent the number of pages of periodicals that were published, regardless of whether they had literature or not on them. So you see that we've got a 
uh, an odd peak here in 1910, where the total number of, um, uh, of pages hit its height. There's some reasons for this. I don't know that I know all of the reasons. Part of it was there was consolidation, even as early as 1910 in the number of periodicals. Partly there was a bit of a consolidation in terms of switching from weekly, which was the preference before then, to uh, semi-monthly or monthly uh, publication in, in many of the uh, periodicals. Um, you see that the top, this top red line is the number of poems. Um, by the way, the, the, the number of pages is on the left here. So you see we've got, in, in the 1910s, we've got 100,000 pages being produced over that decade. Whereas um, the red line here, the poetry, that's um, something like 8,000 poems that were produced in that same decade. Um, but you see that there's a, a bit of a decline after that also, especially in the poetry. There's probably a bit of a, bit of a dip because of World War II. I know that the number of periodical issues that were published <clears throat> went significantly down in 19, the 1940s. <clears throat> um, probably a lot of what's going on. <clears throat> and then in, specifically for poetry, we have this huge drop off after 1950. Um, represents an undoubtedly uh, uh, world culture. Poetry is not as popular. Um, and, um, and I can't help but note that this is also uh, in conjunction with the rise of, of television. Um, and I, I, I seems like that's a competition for a lot of more thoughtful uh, types of literature. Uh, what else? Let's look by language. Um, there are nine different languages that are in the publications that we got there. Um, and it's not well widely known, but um, the uh, first language that outside of English that had periodicals, Mormon periodicals published was Welsh. If you think about it, that makes sense. The missionaries were in uh, the United Kingdom. And so Welsh was the first foreign language that we really had missionaries encountering. Um, but by the 1860s, um, uh, Mormon publishing in Welsh basically stopped. Um, the Danish uh, material started in 1850, the German and the Swedish and the French in the 1860s, although the French stuff was really intermittent, uh, almost non-existent really until the early 1900s. Um, Maori started the 1900s. Um, it's especially interesting, the Maori uh, publication, uh, where uh, they had a, a joint publication called T Kakare, which was the Maori one. I'm sure I've pronounced that incorrect. And the English speaking uh, publication was called The Messenger. And, uh, and it was weekly, but they would trade weeks. So one week was Maori and the sec next week was, was uh, English. Um, really a different approach to publishing. Um, Spanish started in the 1930s and Portuguese in the 1950s. Um, so, I've switched a little bit on this slide um, in, in how I'm counting this. This is basically by language, um, how frequently, how often uh, poet, uh, language appeared uh, over each hundred pages in, in these languages. So English, you've got uh, nearly 10 poems for every hundred pages, whereas short stories, you've got two and a half. Um, in different languages, it's different. Part of the reason is that um, for this, the reason is different is because in outside of English, most of the publications were what we would call uh, mission publications. Their purpose was very much oriented towards keeping the missionaries informed of what's going on and informing the members of the mission um, uh, how things are going, what things that they, they, they needed to know. It was less recreational or less um, entertainment than, um, than the other major category of, of periodicals, and that is periodicals run by the auxiliary organizations of the church. Um, it's also possible um, that uh, the, these foreign languages have some um, uh, error in their numbers, more error than in English, simply because uh, the sample sizes are much smaller, and simply because um, I really don't speak all of these languages. And so I'm guessing in a lot of cases, whether it's a short story or not, and whether it's a, um, a poem, well, poems are easier to tell um, often, at least the traditionally formatted ones. 
So um, anyway, going by periodical, um, I've listed the, the biggest periodicals on here. This large uh, spaced item here um, is um, kind of the remainder. That's all of the bulk of the others. Um, there's many of them. Um, you see uh, a huge number of, um, of periodicals in different languages. Um, I, won't, I won't dwell on this slide too much. These, as I said, the periodicals do differ, differ by type. Um, auxiliary public periodicals include things like the Juvenile Instructor, which is oriented towards the Sunday School, Women's Exponent, the Contributor, which is oriented towards the young women, uh, the young men, excuse me, Young Women's Journal, Children's Friend, which is primary, of course, Relief Society, Improvement Era, which was adult mainly, mainly and the Instructor was also Sunday School one, whereas all of these other ones are mission uh, periodicals. And then you have a few, like uh, most notable is Bakubin, uh, which were um, uh, independent of uh, the, more independent of the church, certainly, but independent of either of these main uh, uh, areas. Uh, Bakubin is especially interesting because it is a Danish language periodical published in Salt Lake City from about um, 1888 through 1935, if I remember correctly. Um, it's a mostly a newspaper for Scandinavian speakers in, in Utah, um, but it had some, some uh, literature in it. And especially in the later years, uh, they would uh, carry a lot of serials. Um, looking at these periodicals um, by how much um, or the frequency of uh, what literature was in them, you see that they, they tend to uh, uh, vary a lot in what they covered. Um, Women's Exponent had uh, at least a poem for every two and a half pages. So this was roughly um, three or four poems per issue of a, the, the women that, Women's Exponent uh, was almost always eight pages long. Um, the the um, notable exceptions to the rule that, uh, that uh, poem, there were always more poems than short stories are the uh, children's oriented stuff where you have these um, relatively short, uh, short stories that are very frequent in them um, compared to the poems that are in the, in this, in the uh, periodical. Um, there's, I think, somewhat of a bias in, um, in, uh, in Mormon literature towards children's literature. It's almost like people thought that, um, or publishers thought that the poetry and um, short stories um, are something that we can that we need to give to kids to help them to learn, instead of um, something that um, is meant for uh, all members of the church. Um, anyway, so I hope that if nothing else, you see that there's a lot. I've learned a few things around the along the way of doing this project, and I hope to learn a little bit more. Um, it, it may we. It may well be today that our culture today, um, I think, uses literature principally in excerpts and in citations that are published in talks and, and articles and those kind of things. That seems to be the principal way that these things get used. Um, I think that it was also true, that this was also true um, going backwards. As we go back into the 1800s, this was true. We um, a lot of conference talks, if you look in the uh, Journal of Discourses, you find that many of these talks would cite or reference um, uh, uh, poetry, especially, um, uh, or, or statements by, um, by authors um, as ways of making their points. Um, so there's lots to be thought about here. Why does this matter? You might ask at this point. This is kind of a philosophical question, and and uh, one I think that's uh, I don't I think I'm speaking to an audience that's always convinced that um, literature does matter, but looking backwards, we sometimes forget how much um, uh, literature makes a difference to us, how um, how much it gets referenced in our daily ways of looking at life, how um, how little snippets of uh, of poetry or stories 
um, uh, are reflected on in our daily lives. Looking at older Mormon literature gives us a window into the culture and the thinking of the past and what was important to them then. As a result, we can look at um, these, past, uh, these past ideas and get a fuller sense for our history, where the ideas that we have in place today, where those came from and why they are important to us today. We can also use looking at this um, stuff, and I think this presentation makes it clear that it helps to understand the cultural structure and infrastructure that was in place at different points. And it might help us to reflect on the cultural structure and infrastructure that we have today or lack thereof. Um, you know, when the church uh, consolidated all of its um, magazines, it changed a lot of things culturally for us. Um, Roadshows over time have gone away as a result of that change. Um, the, the idea that each congregation was supposed to put on a play every year is gone. Um, the idea that members of the church should be writing poetry and short stories has faded away over time because there weren't these outlets for them. This idea of structure, I think, is hugely important. As a result, I have um, a couple of recommendations and conclusions that I want to make about uh, as I wrap this up. Uh, first, I hope that, as if nothing else, that I have demonstrated that Mormon literature is not small. There are, are a lot of Mormon authors. There are a lot of Mormon work that has been produced in the, in, in the past. And we would do, do well to better uh, get to know what has pr been produced in the past. Uh, I think, I, I wonder how the uh, AML 100 that was released last night, how much it would be different if we had accessible to us a large database of all of the Mormon literature that had been produced. What are the gems that we might find? I'm not saying that the gems are more frequent. I'm just saying that when you're talking about numbers of 50,000 poems, there's bound to be something in there that's really good, something that should have been included. Um, I believe that this is all good and important. I want to draw, draw a little bit on, on what Darlene uh, said in her presentation and in her effort. Her effort is basically getting people to do what um, we should be doing, and that is creating. You know, if we look at our theology, this basic Mormon theology, the idea is that we will one day grow up and become like our heavenly parents. And it seems clear to me that that means that we will be creators. And I don't believe that that's creators merely in the parental vein, it is creators in the creating world's vein. And it has to be also creators in the literary vein. So we are all processing what we learn as we read and study literature. We are also need to all take that step of going from mere consumers of literature to creators of literature. So I guess what I'm saying is two things. First, I'm saying that yes, there is enough Mormon literature. We can be proud of what we have. We have plenty. In fact, there's so much that you will not be able to read it all. But I'm also saying, no, there isn't enough. We all need to be creating and becoming more like our heavenly parents. And I hope and pray that we can also do, all do so. Thank you. Thanks, Kent. That is a, an astounding amount of work and really some, some eye-opening um, data there. Um, even even if your sample has some strange outliers on there that, that, that skew the data, we're still talking about thousands and thousands of works of, of Mormon literature. So interesting. Look, look forward to future, future stuff going on there. Okay, now it is time for Gabriel to talk about his efforts to build Mormon literature. Or efforts in general, I guess I, I should say. Um, 
let, let me share, thank you for, for this opportunity uh, to share some of these things. And I do have um, slides because we love images uh, in, in our culture. And um, this will sort of guide the, the discussion. Um, so <clears throat> I'm here to talk about literature, the possibilities of Mormon literatures uh, in languages other than English. Um, and I'm so glad that um, Kent spoke uh, some to this and also this morning um, or earlier today uh, with uh, vampires, there was some talk of that and, and I'll get back to that. But um, so I guess the starting point is uh, since we are talking about Eugene England, uh, his vision and when he considered the prospects of Mormon literature in his 1983 essay, um, he was mostly looking ahead at a fully English language literary horizon. Um, and that makes sense, right? That was uh, the world uh, which he inhabited. Um, and culturally speaking, the, the United States and the English speaking world is the core of um, not only of the church, but of Mormon culture um, broadly. So of course it makes sense that he would not have foreseen or given much thought to a Mormon literature or Mormon literature is arising languages other than English. Um, and that's a bit of what I wanna to discuss today. So um, imagine that he had said uh, this, uh, but some might still be saying, suppose we do have some good writers. Why talk about a Mormon literature rather than a Spanish language literature or better yet, just literature? Shouldn't our writers just do their best, write honestly, and well about the universal human concerns and address themselves to mankind in general, perhaps. But let me suggest another case, Cervantes and Borges had access to audiences and so forth. Anyway, I'm not gonna answer his question. That's not what my uh, my talk is about, but um, rather I, I use this to sort of get us thinking um, among other lines. And I'm gonna talk about the emergence of a Mormon literature um, in Spanish mostly, um, so that the models aren't Milton and Shakespeare, uh, but rather, you know, Garcia Marquez or uh, Garcia Lorca, right? Um, so let me, first of all, do a little bit of history here um, because there's some background and uh, this sort of ties into the things that Kent was discussing. Um, Except for Mexico, the church in Latin America is really a 20th century phenomenon. It starts in 1925 when missionaries start going to Argentina and the last areas are open in the Caribbean in 1978. And as you know, growth was very small at first, then it just blew up. So in 1964, only 0.72% of the church is situated in Latin America. By 2004, it's 37% of the church. Uh, of its members. So of course, to support this kind of growth, the church has periodicals. Um, I have a few of them on screen that you can see. That first one, La Voz del Desierto, is a Mexican periodical that was like not official. Um, but then you get things like El Atalaya, Mensaje de Interés, El Mensajero de Sered. All of these are mission produced um, periodicals. And then starting in 1945, the Liajona, which was under the Mexican mission, but then it sort of became this like imperialist uh, journal that started taking over other journals, if you will, or absorbing other journals. And it became uh, out of Salt Lake City, the church magazine for the whole entire speaking world. So during the 19th century, these publications opened their doors to Spanish language literature, literature that was originally produced in Spanish. There were translations of literature, but also a lot of it was original Spanish language um, productions. And so the, re the reason I mentioned this is because it means that all these journals, when they were mission journals, could sort of create a network of writers. But the distances were great and, and it was difficult. But once this was consolidated under Lejona, then it was easier to create a sort of international um, world or, or field, I guess I should say, for Mormon literature. And that was the only place where it could happen because members of the Church of Latin America are spread out very thin. So it's unlikely to, you, you don't have even today, the critical mass that you would have in the Mormon court or, or even in the US as a whole. Um, so 
uh, what happened was in the 90s, the church got out of the business of publishing literature in Liahona and its, in its publications. Um, and so a lot of these, po mostly poems, but there were also short stories uh, and some personal essays, but it was mostly poems that were published there that sort of disappeared. And you get this impression that Mormon literature in Spanish could have been, and then it wasn't. Um, however, at the dawn of the 21st century, you get um, the right conditions for a reemergence or a new beginning, if you will, um, mostly through technology, because the world of publishing and of communication has changed drastically. Um, so things that didn't exist two decades ago are, are now possible. And what you start seeing is a number of Latter-day Saint writers um, who start sort of self-publishing in different venues through that are made possible through technology. So the development of technology allows for LDS authors to begin publishing on their own independently without having to sort of find church venues to do this. Uh, and so you begin to see, and I just put three examples up on the screen, um, blogs that are, you know, like hardcore literary blogs, um, social media, a lot of people promoting their writings through social media, and of course, self-publishing, which is now more accessible. Um, and so this is sort of all happening at the same time, independently. All these writers are sort of isolated. Um, and I, when I was in, in college, I started seeing that there was like Mormon literature in English. And I went to college at BYU, so that was like, that blew my mind uh, that such a thing could exist. Uh, and then I moved to, um, to Europe and I started finding when I was there. So I was away from the quarter and I was away from Latin America. So my only way to connect with this was through the internet. And I started finding these things, these different writers that were here and there. And, and I would reach out to them and be like, hey, this is great. And most were like, okay, cool, whatever. Um, but I did find two people who were sort of kindred spirits. Uh, and I will show you pictures of them. I will show you a bunch of pictures. You'll see them on the screen right now. Uh, but I'm talking about the first two men on the upper um, row. And uh, the older gentleman, his name is Mario Montani out of Argentina. And he's mostly interested in, um, in Mormon culture generally. And he has a great blog that blogs about different aspects of Mormon culture broadly, including literature. And then in the middle, uh, you have Rafael Vasquez, um, who is very much into literature. He's passionate about it. And because he's a Latter-day Saint, part of his interest is in the literature that's produced by members of the church. Um, and so the two of them were sort of kindred spirits and, and we started communicating and, and we started having lots of conversations over WhatsApp. This couldn't have happened 10 years earlier, for instance. Uh, and at some point we said it would be great if we sort of had some sort of organized uh, group. So we sort of organized. Uh, and we created this thing called Cofradía de Letras Mormonas, um, which is like, you know, brotherhood or group of Mormon letters, or four Mormon letters. Uh, and we're very excited about it. We created a logo and have sort of a, a slogan and things. You can see it there on the screen. Um, and mostly it was sort of, it is still a labor of love. And we thought there's two things that need to be done. One of them is what Kent was talking about, which is, going back and finding all the stuff that's been there all along and nobody knows that it's been there uh, throughout the 20th century. Uh, and the other thing is we need to find all these people that are sort of writing on their own uh, who are either members of the church or who are writing very much about uh, Mormon themes and, and so forth. Um, and that became sort of our clarion call. Um, we decided at some point that we needed a newsletter of some sort. And that's how El Pregonero de Seret, um, or the Desert Town Crier, came into existence. Um, and so we published that every three months. Now, that's a lot of work. That's really all we can do. Um, and it's also very sort of heavy in terms of graphic work. None of us are good at that. Um, and so we had... Um, Two people volunteered to, to join us and they're both related to Mario. Um, and that's the, the two people that you see in the middle there. 
um, Patricio Mancilla and Indira de Viaje. They're from Argentina uh, and they're both graphic designers and they, they design things. And so if you look at El Pregonero, it honestly looks like a thousand bucks. And that's because these two people are very good at what they do. Um, and our sort of new horizon, if you will, our new layer is to try to have an online presence. And that's very hard for us because, um, because we don't have the time and because we're not as tech savvy as, as um, for instance, the last person that you see there uh, at the bottom um, of the screen, Marjorie Sukali, she's Peruvian and she's recently joined us to help us exist online. Uh, and so this is sort of how we became organized with these two goals uh, that I mentioned. Now, as we began doing this, some synergy started to be created. Like I said, really all of our efforts go into the Pregonero, the, the magazine. Uh, it's a PDF, so it doesn't exist uh, on paper. Um, on the left side of your screen, you can see some of the covers. Um, you see how they get better and how it originally started as just like news. But we started including literature even from the very first issue that we got out of old church magazines. Uh, and then we started doing interviews and uh, reviews. Um, and so when we find new people, uh, we interview them. We, when we find out that somebody has published something uh, or that somebody has won an award or whatever, we put it on there on a news section. Um, we also do other forms of art, not just literature. Uh, we've spotlighted a woman who makes dolls. We've spotlighted uh, musicians and painters. And so it's mostly about literature, but it, it's sort of blurry around the edges. Um, now, what ended up happening was um, that we found an ally in the, um, in the AML. So through, um, mostly through the website initially, uh, we were able to publish about some of the things that we were doing. And you see the sort of a screenshot there. Andrew Hall has been really instrumental and very supportive of us, of us um, in, in having an outlet where we can let English speakers know about what's going on sort of in the Spanish speaking world. Um, and then um, we've also had some synergies with, uh, with the, the Mormon Lit Lab. James Goldberg reached out to me. And I mean, who does this, right? He just writes to me out of the blue. I've never had any contact with him. And he's like, how can I help? Uh, and so, um, because he saw us on the blog, right? And so how can I help? And, and we've gotten support um, from him and his amazing group, uh, including the creation in 2020 of the launch of a, we had a contest uh, and we got so many uh, entries that, I mean, we were really overwhelmed by the amount of entries that came in from different places covering all sorts of genres. Um, and ever since we've had the contest, we keep having people write and say, when's the next one? And our answer is always, we'll see, because it really was sort of like too much for us to handle. Uh, so at some point we'd like to have um, another one. Uh, so these synergies have been very productive for us. Let me tell you about one um, also in Portuguese. So when we did the contest, uh, and this is, I mentioned this because this is how these things sort of move about uh, when you're doing it for the love of the game, right? So when we did the contest, we got an entry called El Vampiro Mormon. If this sounds familiar, or if this face looks familiar, it's because you were here in the earlier session um, by Renan Silva. And the entry didn't win the contest, but we were intrigued by it. So we said, let's publish it in El Pregonero in a future issue. In addition to that, I was intrigued by the fact that I could tell that the author was Brazilian. So, so I contacted him and, and we got to talking, that's him on the picture. Um, and he served his mission in Argentina. So his Spanish is really good. Uh, he's sort of a repentant lawyer like me. Uh, well, he's not repentant, he still practices. But uh, so we both have legal training. And, uh, but he loves literature like I do. And we had long conversations about Mormon literature in English and Spanish and also in Portuguese. Uh, and he was very interested in the things that we had done. Uh, and so we had these long discussions. Um, he, he decided to create a Facebook group for 
LDS Mormon writers. Um, and eventually that Facebook group evolved into the Brazilian Association of Latter-day Saint Writers, which has just been organized earlier this year um, in which Renan Silva um, presides. So in our conversations with him, he's mentioned to me that he feels that the moment is right for something with Mormon letters uh, in Spanish, but also in Portuguese. He's like, I can just feel it, it's in the air. There's lots of people that are doing things sort of independently from each other. And now technology allows us to um, come in contact uh, and to do this. So we have, we begin to see this sort of establishment, if you will. So looking forward, I will wrap up with this. What's the, what's the road ahead? Um, the road ahead looks um, difficult because um, we don't have permanent venues in which we might publish. Uh, so, you know, we have El Pregonero, but the day any of us retires or gets sick, there's a question as to whether that might go on. Um, it's really a for the love of the game publication. Uh, so that goes to the issue of permanence. The other thing is we don't have a literary criticism and that's a sign that a literature has matured, right? That people start looking at it from a critical lens. Um, so that might come down the line. It's not there yet, which means that this is just budding. Um, and also we don't have a house. Uh, there's no institutional support. These organizations are from people who are passionate about this, but who hold everyday jobs. Um, and so again, this goes to the question of permanence. But there are things going for it. Uh, so this is the, the good news. And the good news is that demographics is destiny. Uh, and so as long as the church continues to grow in Latin America, as well as in Africa's Portuguese speaking countries, there will be members of the church. So there will be Mormons writing for Mormons about Mormons. Um, and, and I mentioned Portuguese speaking Africa because demographic projections for the growth of those countries are enormous. And so if church growth sort of keeps up, then they'll be giving Brazil a run for their money in terms of the, where the Portuguese speakers of the future are. Um, so, so there's sort of, there's questions, but there's also a lot of good news looking ahead. Uh, and we are of course, just happy to be part of that. Thank you, gracias, obrigado. Thanks, Gabriel. So I have two questions for our panelists. And uh, Gabriel actually kind of spoke to this towards the end of his pre presentation, but maybe we could get a, a few more details if he wants to, or he could just leave it to, to Kent and Darlene. But um, all of these efforts that you have engaged in are Herculean. Um, they help greatly enlarge the field of Mormon letters in the sense that, that, that you're documenting stuff and you're, and you're like, if you look at, 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 at what each of you has done, we have, and, and if somebody didn't know about those, these three efforts previously, all of a sudden the field of Mormon literature for them has enlarged vastly, right? Um, and um, one of my critiques of, of, of Eugene England is, as, is that, um, specifically with his essay, Mormon Literature, Progress and Prospects, but also a lot of his other efforts is that he didn't always talk about the, or didn't, or rarely talked about the efforts, the money, the resources that are required to produce Mormon literature and Mormon criticism. Um, and to Gab Gabrielle's point, um, you know, the Association of Mormon Letters currently does not have any sort of academic affiliation with any, any, any colleges and is, is very much also just a, a volunteer effort. Um, so what frustrations have you encountered in your efforts to contribute to the field of Mormon literature, but also what are you optimistic about when it comes to the future of Mormon literature? Um, and so if you'd like to speak on that, I'd love to have like Darlene first and then Kent and then Gabrielle, if you have anything additional to say, that would be great. So Darlene. So um, my biggest frustration for a long time has been that lack of uh, institutional or academic cachet for people who participate in Mormon literature. Um, I think that was one of the problems. Um, one of the th con contributing factors to the weakening of AML, it was a really robust organization and then it wasn't for a while. And part of that was because we had um, 
we couldn't get busy professors to want to be involved with us because they couldn't um, they weren't getting anything on their resumes or any um, if anything they were getting reprimanded for the time that they participated in Mormon Lit it was like something that BYU was ashamed of and so you weren't going to get anything here um, so there's that it's like is this um, this lack of I, I don't know what lack of prestige I suppose um, that contributed to people not knowing whether it was worth their time. And then it was a shortage of um, publishers. Like if you're going to produce something that's a little bit more complicated and isn't your basic um, juvenile instructor, nourishing moralistic short story with, with a happy lesson to be taught. If you were producing literary work, where was it going to get published? And we pretty much had um, signature and you know, maybe you could get at University of Utah Press to pick something up, but there was, just wasn't places. Which brings me into what brings me hope. There's so many exciting things happening. Um, new publishers who are taking risks and showing that there's an audience. Um, BCC is one of them, but there's a few. And um, I like to see that Iriantum is still sometimes coming out. And I um, the internet makes that easier because with the lack of uh, money, you can still produce something. And I think that the whole blog um, revolution on the internet contributed a little bit. It's it um, it's kind of sad. I don't see a whole lot of blogging being done anymore. But and the um, the better pieces of the blogging, I think uh, you're not seeing quite as many opportunities for them to publish. We've got Exponent Two, and um, I mean some of the ladies' journals, Segala. Um, but some of those essays, I don't know where they're being published. That's harder. But I do have hope. I think we're starting to show that there is an audience. We've got these um, these uh, Mormon studies departments at, that are showing up here and there. That's a good thing. And I'd like to see um, those departments um, showing a lot more interest in what's currently being published as well as what was published in the past. I think they are starting to do that. And a symposium like this helps. 100% agree with what with uh, Darlene said. Um, my frustration, uh, especially, is with the the publishing end of things. Um, I I found that um, the kind of traditional Mormon publishing industry has been um, completely brain dead when it comes to anything outside of what they what a very narrow definition of what Mormons want. Um, and I think that uh, they still are in a, a mindset where um, where the world is um, and the Mormon world is on the Wasatch Front only. Um, this especially is con of concern when it comes to languages. Um, it's it, to me this day and in, in age, it's inexcusable that Desert Books website is not available in Spanish or in Portuguese. Does not make any sense to me at all. They have people that speak Spanish and Portuguese that are coming to their website, and they do not provide anything for them at all. Um, you know, if if we're going to have the ability for Mormon materials to spread outside of Utah, you've got to actually treat that world as if it exists and pro and, and provide for it. Um, I, I I'm always uh, surprised also at the lack of knowledge that uh, the average member of the church has about um, Mormon literature. And it, it starts, I, I don't want to speak ill of the brethren, but the, the fact of the matter is, is that the brethren don't seem to be any more clued in than, than the average member. Um, and, and they don't, you know, they don't cite, you know, our, our, our poets. They don't, you know, they, they will have no problem uh, citing Wordsworth, but, um, you know, they don't know Eliza R. Snow, Snow beyond, um, uh, you know, oh, my father, basically. Um, there's there's so much there that could be useful. And that's one of the reasons why, you know, this idea that of getting the materials accessible is, I think, something that could make a huge difference, simply because we you provide a place where people can go and say, oh, I have a talk on tithing. Let me see if I can find a poem that is about tithing. And there are poems in tithing. And this is in, even though I have a, you know, <laughs> a mere, mere 3,000 poems in my database, there are poems about tithing. Um, so 
you know, I, that's kind of my frustration. But I share the, I, the, the, the optimism that, um, number one, that, that, that the world's getting more connected and more able to, um, to, to find these things. Um, that, you know, we have, you know, things like the Confraria and uh, Absud in, in Brazil that are coming out that um, where people are connecting. Um, I, I share the optimism that, um, that we, we've got, the AML is cooking along in a, in a really good direction right now. And I'm, I'm you know, I, I just wanna know how can I help and how can I get involved and what can I do to, to, to really make this work? Um, and especially now that I'm nearing retirement, I feel like I might have time to actually spend time on this stuff. So um, yeah, I'm very, very pleased. So um, yeah, I agree. I think these are very keen analysis and um, I'd like to touch on the issue of distribution, um, thinking of sort of a broader scale, uh, not just US based, but if we're thinking of other languages, um, one of the issues uh, is that, you know, the first thing is there's really no place for publication right now. I mentioned that. Um, and ultimately, writers want to get published, right? Uh, but, um, but even if you get, say, if you were to get some sort of, um, like Desert Books started publishing in Spanish, that would be amazingly good. Uh, but it would still fall very short in the sense that um, there's a book can't really get books into Chile, for instance, not without it becoming prohibitively expensive for people in Chile who might want to buy it. Uh, even Amazon is not an answer to that. If I like I'm in Uruguay right now, if I want to buy a book through Amazon that comes out of the US, I'm going to end up paying close to 60 bucks with shipping and taxes and other things. So that's not going to happen. Um, so distribution becomes a big issue when you're talking about a transnational uh, reading population, um, which is sort of what we have at the Cofradia. Um, so really, it fits, it has to sort of right now be online and honestly be free. Um, but if we could figure out some way to be able to distribute the works in different markets uh, without it becoming prohibitively expensive, then that would be encouraging because people would see a book with their name, which is not rare for English speaking authors who are LDS and writing Mormon literature, but really like super weird if you're writing Mormon things in Spanish or in Portuguese. Um, so, so that's one of the challenges. Uh, and, and it always ties back to money and institutional support. Institutional support, of course, is linked to funding. Um, and so, so yeah, these are, these are some big challenges. We've given this a lot of thought in discussions in the Cofradia, and we can't figure it out. Um, but I am nonetheless optimistic because um, I think my friend Brennan is right. There's something, th the moment is right. There's, this is not going to, will go away, but this will continue to, to grow. Uh, it's, it's slowly taking a life of its own. So I'm optimistic for what the future will be. I just don't know what it will be. Thanks, Gabriel. Uh, and thank, thanks, Darlene, and uh, thank you, Darlene and Kent. Um, uh, you know, thank, thank you, all three of you, for um, the efforts that you've made, and hopefully, will continue to make um, in this field. Uh, two, a couple of follow-up points. The first is that um, one of the issues with publications, uh, setting aside, let's say you know, funding and infrastructure and all that, is there is a lack of editorial talent in Mormon literature. Um, and, you know, and frankly, some of our best editors are also our creative writers. Um, and it is, um, it can be very, you know, uh, I'm not saying I'm one of those best, but um, I do have a little bit of output as an, as an editor. And you're always stealing time, right, from your creative work in order to do it. And I think it's worth it, and, and, and I will be continuing to do it every so often, but it's not something I can really devote myself to. Um, so that, that's, that's one thing. Um, the second thing is, um, in terms of criticism, um, 
you know, yes, there's a lack of institu institutional support. And, and if Mormon studies continues to grow, if, if um, Mormon criticism can kind of make a more of a name for itself and, 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 and get a little bit more of that Mormon studies funding and support, then I think that will be valuable. But, um, but to, to Gabrielle's point about the importance of, 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 of literary criticism, and, and, and I would also include in that literary history, um, biblio, kind of literary cataloging, and bibliographic work, like what Kent is talking about and kind of redescribing uh, older works, is that um, <clears throat> the incentive to do that work is even lower than, than, than creative writing, right? <clears throat> because, um, because at least with creative writing, you know, you get that name on that book, even if it's an ebook. Um, and maybe some people will even buy it and read it. Um, but honestly, the, the audience for, for reading literary criticism is really low. low. And so, um, so any efforts that we can do, and this is something that, that I hope um, the AML can continue to work on, and, and the, our two panels today have been an effort in that, is to continue to work on this, this, this uh, project of reading and interpreting the works that we have and cataloging and looking at and rediscovering and bringing back the works that we have lost. And so um, I hope this, that this is a conversation that we continue to have and that these are efforts that we'll be, we'll be able to continue to celebrate in the future. That's it for our panels kind of related to, to, to Mormon criticism. We come back next at 2 p.m. Mountain Time with a conversation with Darlene Young, who is our 2022 Smith Pettit Foundation Award for Outstanding Cont Contribution to Mormon Letters. And she will be in conversation with Angela Halstrom. Following that at 3.30 Mountain Time, there will be a conversation between Michael Austin, who is our 2022 AML Lifetime Achievement Award winner, and he will be in conversation with John Benyon. So we hope you will join the, us for those. Finally, this evening, we will present the AML Awards. We will now see uh, award win uh, the winners for our AML Awards, and there will then be a reading by some of the winners. So thank you so much.